Vallahi Murgulis. Vallahi Murgulis. Bu dua eres. Vallahi Murgulis. Yes. All men must die. Vallahi dua eres. All men must serve. Vallahi Murgulis. Vallahi dua eres. Velar Margulis, Velar de Hyrus. The common greeting response couplet from the continent of Essos is exactly the kind of unimportant small detail that, that authors only include to give glaring hints at the deeper thematic meaning of their story. The phrases translate to, All men must die, and all men must serve. I chose this detail, but I could have easily taken the motto of the drowned god, What is dead may never die, or the tenets of the many-faced gods religion, which demand that its followers become no one, to introduce the idea, Game of Thrones is thematically centered around existential philosophical questions. Many of you may have heard of existential philosophy, but may not really know what it is. Existentialism argues that whatever forces the external world uses to pressure a person, there is still always room for choice on that person's part. Existentialist philosophers would say that an individual's choice is not restricted by their facticity, which means all those properties that third-person investigation can establish about me. Natural properties such as weight, height, skin color, social facts such as race, class, and nationality, psychological properties such as my web of belief, desires, and character traits, historical facts such as my past actions, my family background, and my broader historical milieu, and so on. It doesn't take much to see how these ideas about personal essence connect to political ideas of freedom of choice for individuals and abhorrence of slavery and stereotyping. We see this philosophy illustrated in the ways female characters frequently break stereotyped gender roles despite the obvious pressure from society to conform. The male gender roles are also explored in characters like Samuel Tarley or the couple thousand eunuchs running around in the story. Class roles are explored in characters like Jon Snow and Ser Davos, Knight of Onions, both of whom are in the running for most noble characters in their respective main and supporting character weight classes, and both of whom were at least technically commoners early in life. There's bigotry against the wildlings on the part of the people of the Seven Kingdoms. All wildlings are liars and savages with no loyalty to anything or anyone. And the cultural expectations of the free people for the southerners is comparably constrained. All you lot from south of the wall, you southerners. But now you're in the north. The real north. Even the non-binding nature of one's own past actions is explored by characters like Jorah and Theon. There are too many examples to enumerate them all. Existentialism goes much farther than the impositions of people on oneself and argues that any imposition from the external universe should be held separate from our responsibility for our choices. The concept of authenticity is how some existential philosophers labeled this idea that you should be expressing in action what you truly feel internally, regardless of the obstacles. With respect to our opening couplet, All Men Must Die, All Men Must Serve, George R. R. Martin is pointing at the many occurrences in his world where characters are faced with a choice of this form. Do this action, or greatly imperil your own life. Dracarys. Frequently in his world, if you are acting in accordance with self-preservation, you are likely not serving your own internal will and desires, but are likely bowing to the will of forces outside of oneself. Likewise, if one is truly imposing one's will on the external universe, it is almost necessarily an act of sacrifice, most potently of one's own life. The use of the word must in the couplet is ironic, because normally it signifies lack of choice, but by using it twice here, there is a suggestion that both are possible, and that perhaps choosing among the options of service and death is also possible. Of course, this choice is exactly the kind of choice existentialist philosophers view as importantly revealing of the self, despite the potential threat of death on one side of the choice. It seems much of Game of Thrones' point is about how choosing to greatly imperil or even outright end one's own life may in fact be the superior option. Corn Halfhan asking Jon Snow to kill him in front of the wildlings in order to help Jon Snow is a case where a character was choosing to die 
Now granted, Corrin was probably only giving up some views of the scenery and an opportunity to be tortured to death by sacrificing himself in a mock fight with John, but even this could be viewed as a microcosm of the choices for self-sacrifice. Yes, Corrin was going to die much sooner than others faced with the choice of dishonorable action or temporary life extension, but if Rob Stark just sat and did nothing of the death of his father, one could argue that the remainder of his life would likely be as empty and meaningless as Corrin's march to an inevitable, painful death through the bleak northern wilderness. Tyrion's choice to lead the defense at King's Landing at the Battle of the Black Water may have been a similar choice of likely immediate death versus a slightly postponed death, but this didn't stop Joffrey from being tempted to cower in hiding. Other examples of cases where people risked immediate death to avoid meaningless, slight postponements of death include Jon Snow taking his last best shot to retake Winterfell despite the risks. It's not enough! No, it's not enough! It's what we have! Hodor sacrificing himself to hold the door, Sam not allowing Gilly to be raped by other knights' watchmen, or Ser Davos standing up on several occasions to dutifully offer a contradicting opinion to his lord. I let him go. But even more than simply being an occasionally correct and valid option, the metaphysics of Game of Thrones make sacrifice into an inverse of service, whereby sacrificing allows one to impose more of their own will on the world. This is clearly illustrated by the necessity of blood sacrifice in the workings of most types of magic, most dramatically perhaps with the birth of dragons. Less directly, the willingness of Jon Snow to sacrifice himself for the Free Folk at Hartholm created a strong bond of loyalty with them. By pursuing the alliance with the Free Folk to the exclusion of other possibilities, notably the possibility of internal cohesion within the Night's Watch and his own continued mortal existence, he concentrated enough willful energy to bring about the alliance. For the Watch. Ultimately, I would predict the story will play out to show that the noble self-sacrifice of Ned Stark was much more effective at achieving his goals than other characters, most importantly Cersei. Particularly, he will be shown to be more successful at the goals of endurance of his family, the perpetuation of his cultural values and traditions, and being remembered favorably. Family, duty, honor. Is that the right order? You know it is. And in doing so, Martin is definitively breaking with a nihilistic or absurdist worldview. This may be a surprising assertion, considering the copious levels of mayhem, gore, and general chaos in the story, coupled with the apparent complete silence of various deities. A writer friend of mine told me he received a note from an executive instructing him to make a script more like Game of Thrones. When I asked him what that meant, he said, It basically means to make all the characters be dicks to each other for no reason. Martin is reflecting a theme of existential philosophy that we must avoid deception, including self-deception, about the nature of the world particularly with reference to the way social constructions gloss over uglier aspects. This is another facet of what existential philosophers were discussing with the concept of authenticity. But Martin gives his world a justice mechanism which gives us insight into the reasoning of the deities of Game of Thrones, and which definitively breaks from the idea of meaningless, chaotically amoral reality. Relora and the Drowned God have opposite approaches to the existential questions of the show, but share a lack of moral direction in the choices faced by their adherents. The Lord of Light encourages his followers to burn brightly, signifying existentialist views that some possibilities may be sacrificed or burned in order to enhance the potential for other possibilities, specifically the possibilities that are expressing the inner desires of the follower. The Lord's fire lives within me, Jon Snow. The Red God would probably encourage bold acts of self-sacrifice for great causes, while the Drowned God extorts followers to let go of ambition and goes in a more Buddhist direction, calling for an end of internal desire and a realization of the power loss of ego gives. Let the old Euron drown. Let his lungs fill with sea water. He probably would frown on self-sacrifice for a cause, but he also would frown on over-attachment to life, as both things imply caring about something. The Iron Islands is probably what happens when a society responds to every problem or issue with, I don't care. It's a land where possession is ten-tenths of the law. I don't think either R'hllor nor the Drowned God have any particular issue with someone pursuing an evil life, either because they want to or because they don't care to be good. Just be passionate about being evil to appease the Red God, or be completely apathetic towards good to appease the Drowned God. 
Neither R'hllor nor the Drowned God balance the self-expression of their followers against any restriction which makes room for the choices of others. The faith of the Seven and the religion of the Old Gods in the North give more moral guidance. The Old Gods don't seem to have a religious text, but their religion largely consists of prohibitions against various dishonorable acts. There isn't much said about the Old Gods, but I am increasingly suspicious that they represent an older version of the same concepts represented in the Faith of the Seven. According to the books, weirwood involvement was at the suggestion of the Children of the Forest, and the actual Faith seems to worship the other trees, just near to weirwood trees. There are parallels in the multiplicity of deities between the religions, with weirwoods seeming to represent the stranger's role through a variety of symbolism. The other trees represent the six. The spiral patterns of the children and the others have seven arms. The Faith of the Seven comes closest to being a full illustration of George R. R. Martin's philosophy of authenticity. The Faith of the Seven outlines six general categories of authentic roles, and identifies a seventh none-of-the-above category, which essentially represents making an invalid choice. We ask the Father to judge us with mercy, accepting our human frailty. We ask the Mother to bless our crops, so we may feed ourselves and all who come to our door. We ask the warrior to give us courage in these days of strife and turmoil. We ask the maiden to protect Sally's virtue and keep her from the clutches of depravity. You're going to do all seven of the fuckers? Father! We ask the smith to strengthen our hands and our backs so we may finish the work required of us. We ask the crone to guide us on our journey from darkness to darkness. And we ask the stranger not to kill us in our beds tonight for no damn reason at all. I've heard it argued that the seven all represent death, and that is in some sense true. But there's a distinction between inauthentic death, which achieves nothing, and an authentic death, which represents the inner will of the individual in action. Each of the six good or authentic deities represents some role or motive that many of the characters in the show are fulfilling or trying to fulfill, and which is worth sacrificing time and physical safety to achieve. The father represents maintenance of values and social order. Ned Stark and Tywin Lannister would represent attempts to fulfill this role through most of their in-show plot lines, although Ned seems to be more successful at fulfilling this role, considering the probable downfall of Cersei and the fact that Tyrion despises everything the Lannister family stood for. The warrior represents change of values in social order, and could be represented possibly by a young rebel Ned Stark, Arya, or Brienne of Tarth. The smith represents work, and sometimes applied wisdom more generally. Tyrion, Samwell, and possibly occasionally Daenerys represent this role in their plot lines. I've heard it argued that the smith and work represent servitude, but this is incorrect. Let's think about how creepy that is for a second. The faith essentially turns people into slaves by telling them that working their asses off is a form of prayer that pleases one of the seven gods that they full well know doesn't actually exist. I'd ask, who was Gendry serving when he forged his own armor? I made it for me. The labor of Tyrion and Varys to hold the world together also represents authentic choices on their parts. They aren't being forced to be advisors or rulers and the like. They have means to live leisurely, quiet lives if they choose to. The mother represents nurturing the young and leaving literal genetic descendants. And obvious instantiations of this role include Cat Stark and Cersei. But also arguably Ned Stark fulfills this role when he gives Arya a fencing instructor. The maiden represents beauty, being well liked, and being good company. Sansa is perhaps a portrayal of this role, but Marjorie Tyrell may be the best example. Tyrion, Theon, and Jorah have very interesting relations to this existential goal. All are characters who for a very long time pursue being liked or well respected, and have issues with being romantically loved. The crone represents transmission of wisdom and is most clearly represented in Olenna Tyrell's character, although Master Aemon and the Three-Eyed Crow are other good examples. These examples are not meant to be exhaustive, clearly characters can flow from one role to another, and give commentary on a role which is secondary to a more primary role for the character. And then there's the none of the above choice. The stranger represents doing things which will ultimately endanger yourself and your family, bring harm to your society, weaken its institutions, reduce its ability to self-maintain, and bring infamy on you and your name. 
The Stranger is also the title of the most famous work from the existential philosopher Camus. The book describes someone who rejects all societal conventions, resulting in him being hated and eventually executed. The Stranger is self-annihilation in essence, and represents yin. Choosing to emulate the concept of the Stranger could theoretically be a life goal, and would represent an existentially valid choice if the choice is made authentically, but this is not often the case. You would have to hate the world in very much a basically completely suicidal and possibly spiteful way. That said, Tommen is a good example of someone who really does make an active choice to end his life for basically that reason, feeling as though all his other volitional power had been taken from him. Enslaved people may also want to exercise this option authentically. But most of the time, characters fulfilling the role of the stranger are not doing it on purpose. Stannis was trying to play the role of the father, but did so ineptly and wound up being the stranger. From a purely existential point of view, you could argue his decisions were valid. The existentialist would say he pursued his ambition to the end. He died knowing he did everything he could. Relore would be proud, but six of the seven at least would not be. The positive six of the seven represent life goals echoed in the Tully family motto, family, family duty, duty, honor. honor. These are the life choices and goals which Martin wants to assign positive value. Goals of preserving DNA are associated with family and the mother. Transmitting culture and values to the future is associated with duty, the father, smith, and the warrior. Being well liked and remembered as good is what is meant by honor, and is clearly associated with the maiden. The crone kind of floats over the whole thing and is responsible for resolving disputes when, for example, being well liked conflicts with disciplining your children. While straight up ineptitude exists and can land you in the role of the stranger, this doesn't tell us much about Martin's justice engine. A more interesting question is why Cersei has been such a failure in her role as mother when others like Catelyn Stark have been more successful or will presumably be shown to be successful by the conclusion of the series. Isn't Mother one of the good goals? Cersei is brutal. Martin points to this in many ways, but simply put, the mountain is her physical reflection. Physically ugly where she is physically beautiful, physically powerful where she is physically weak, but spiritually, they are similarly brutal. Brutality in this existentialist language of choice and desire means to pursue your own authentic desires, as existentialists would always encourage, but to do so without due attention and consideration to the desires of others, and their ability to make choices that further their own goals, disempowering others more than necessary. This pursuit of one's own goals without care for others is perhaps most forcefully represented in the act of rape, a motif that occurs frequently in the show. Cersei's reflection in the mountain is one of the more notable perpetrators of this crime. I killed her children! Then I raped her! So what is so bad about frustrating the pursuits of others? The metaphysics of Martin's existentialist universe point to the idea that when you prune away the potential to fulfill goals from others, they gain increased ability to fulfill other goals, specifically revenge on you for harming them. Elena Terrell illustrated this nicely in the last episode of season 6. After the death of her entire family, she was free to pursue revenge with complete abandon even at the cost of her life or her house's power. Cersei stole the future from me. She killed my son. She killed my grandson. She killed my granddaughter. Survival is not what I'm after now. If you dishonor a person's culture and traditions, destroy their ability to learn, kill their family, make them despised, and prevent them from transmitting their wisdom in old age, and you removed all possible meaning for their existence, except assuming the role of the warrior to change you and your position of power. This means all the volitional energy that have gone into all the other five existence-oriented goals instead goes into a revenge-focused warrior. We see this perhaps best illustrated in Arya's plotline. If she were fettered by the continued existence of her mother or extended family, she would likely be groomed for a diplomatic wedding and a life away from Needle. Now she's a cruise missile of revenge. She has none of the attachments to the other six of seven, like John did to the father when he was obeying the tradition of adherence to his oath to the Night's Watch, or Rob did to the maiden when he married his true love, or Sansa does to the maiden in femininity, or Cat had to the mother with her freeing of Jamie. But more potently, 
the origins of the Faceless Men were in slavery, and this lack of choice is what gave them mystical power to overcome their masters. None of the first Faceless Men were born to lords and ladies. They began as slaves in the mines of Valyria. And so this is how George R. R. Martin argues against nihilism in his work. I've been all over the world, and if there's one thing I've learned, it's that meanness comes around. People like your sister, they always get what's coming to them, eventually. One way or another. This means that there's no possible evil prefix for the mother or any other role. If you try to be evil while being the mother, you only end up generating an overwhelming self-defeating counterforce from the revenge you empower. You end up self-defeating, just a very specific kind of ineptness that will lead to ultimately fulfilling the stranger's role. By being evil, you are working against your own existence, because you're headed towards being a stranger type, essentially representative of non-existence. Ramsey Snow is perhaps the best example of this. Sansa explains to him that his evil will result in erasing his lineage, his house, and its practices, and ultimately his name will be forgotten. Your words will disappear. Your house will disappear. Your name will disappear. All memory of you will disappear. Evil results in the frustration of all other possible life paths and an evil person's intentions will be pushed into non-existence represented by the stranger. So even though George R. R. Martin takes existential authenticity as one core theme of his work, his point is that it must ultimately be tempered and restrained in a way that ensures that it does not interfere with the goals of others more than necessary. This restraint is the yin to existential authenticity's yang, a duality also reflected in the opening couplet, Valor Margulis, Valor Dohiris. In this way, Martin creates an idea which could be called constrained authentic choice and rejects existential philosophy's concepts of nihilism, absurdism, and radical choice. Thanks for listening. Leave a comment below letting me know what you think, and please consider liking and subscribing if you thought what I said was interesting or insightful. This is Shiva's Right Foot, and I'll talk to you next time.